some trouble with this earlier. So, would they? Yeah. I did not say shit. Uh, earlier, a little bit earlier, so this was, no, I, think I think we're on. We're on. Yep. All right. Uh, Red, just curious, the order after you. I'm number three. I'll be last. Uh, good. All right, welcome. Thank you for being here. We are in the closing session of Herasis and in, in the India meeting here in Athens. So thank you for a great couple of days. And, and I have to say, Frank, you have done it again. You have brought a wonderful group of people together for wonderful conversation. Let's give him a round of applause. And uh, my name is Rhett Power. It's an honor to be here. To close out this session with you, I run a company called Accountability Inc., which is a, a global executive coaching firm, and I also write for Forbes, and uh, I'm also an entrepreneur, and so this week, this, this last couple of days, I've learned so much about uh, India and Greece and the, and the, the potential uh, that is there for those two countries, and so my panel... I'm excited to have them up here today because we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that potential. We're going to talk about cross-border trade. We're going to get into a bunch of issues. And then we're going to actually get you guys involved. I like getting the audience involved. I'd love to ask, get your questions up here to the panel. So we're going to try to do a lot in the next hour. But I want to give each one of you a few minutes to uh, make an opening statement. And then we're going to introduce the topic here in a few minutes. But I will start with... Uh, Rajiv. Rajiv, will you give us a few minutes? With pleasure. With pleasure. Thanks, Rhett. And uh, uh, welcome again. Uh, I know it's the, the, one of the difficult plenary sessions because everybody goes up to their room, dresses up, and comes down for <laughs> dinner. <That's> so, right. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, friends, it's great to, to be back here uh, uh, once again. And uh, basically... I think both the government, that is the government in Greece and the government in India, and business, the business in India and the business here, need to engage and encourage cross-border collaborations. Uh, whether the collaboration is through trade, whether it's through technology, whether it's through joint ventures, whether it's through outright investments. But these are the ways that both the government and the business, particularly the chambers of commerce, need to encourage. From the government side, one of the biggest hurdles that I've heard in the last few days from my Greek friends, and I've heard also from my Indian friends, is the visa problem. Because unless you have visas, you can't travel, right? And uh, although, uh, I mean, you have uh, all the various virtual uh, uh, sort of uh, systems such as Zoom and many others, mm -hmm. but that is not the same thing. You can't do, uh, you can't initiate business that way in, in a cold fashion. So this is one big problem and I think both governments need to do it. There's a, from the Greek side, it's going to be more difficult because they have to follow the Schengen rules, being part of the EU, right? right? But what can still be done is mount missions whether they are government uh, missions uh, along with business teams or whether they are chambers. Because when you go uh, on through chambers or through government delegations, visas become a much easier problem. The other thing that can be done, again, on a government-to-government -government basis or university-to-university -university basis is establish incubators and, and accelerators. And this will help a lot particularly in startup, and India has the third world's largest ecosystem in startups. And it creates a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs. And Greece has certain niche areas. For example, uh, robotics in maritime. They're very advanced in that. They're advanced in many other AI functions. They are fairly advanced in data analysis. And so is India. So it's, it's a good fit, but it's a question of meeting and getting together. So you have to have, from the government side, 
a two-way regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, uh, let me take a pause then, and in the interest of time, I'll come to the business uh, side and responsibilities a bit later. Thank you. Shri. Oh, yes. uh, lovely to be uh, with all of you here today. Shri Preetaj and I are co-creators of the Oneness Movement, and our work is present in over 100 countries, and our main center is ACOM in India, and people from all over the world come to learn from us in becoming enlightened. So today I'm going to speak to you about Oneness Leadership. Uh, it's a radical way of leading your businesses, leading your families, and whatever you're doing, be it a politician, whatever you're doing, you're leading it from a Oneness state. So what is a oneness leadership? What is being a oneness leader? A oneness leader is one who has transcended all forms of division and separation. The consciousness of that being is not rooted in division or separation, but it's rooted in oneness. Now, what is separation? A consciousness that is rooted in separation is always thinking about the me and the mine. The radius of that consciousness is what is there in this for me and what is there in this for myself. Now, when you are operating from such a consciousness, uh, we can say that it's a separation-driven consciousness. It is a self-centric-driven consciousness. It's not other-centric-driven consciousness. From me and the mind, we need to move to we. And that consciousness is oneness consciousness. Now, there has to be three major shifts that needs to happen if you want to be a oneness leader. Uh, the oneness state I'm talking about is your inner state. Uh, the three shifts are, the first shift is where you move from being a pleasure-driven leader to a purpose-driven leader. Uh, pleasure is where you are doing everything for your pleasure, be it your position, be it your business, be it earning wealth, be it the job you're doing. Everything is ultimately in fulfilling your pleasure, your needs of pleasure. When you become a purpose-driven leader, you are truly connected to the purpose, and you're not doing your, what you're doing for your pleasures, but you're actually doing for solving a problem or for the vision that you created the business for. It is no more about me or mine, it is about the other. The second important shift that needs to happen is from being a comparison-driven leader, you need to become a cooperation-driven leader. Unfortunately, we are all uh, you know, people who have grown up with hurts and we have been compared when we are young by our parents, by our teachers, by our institutions, and we are constantly trying to grow in life by comparing ourselves with others from where we are and where we want to go. And when you are doing that, again, it's a me and the mind consciousness. You are doing what you're doing to look better, to look greater and stronger in others' eyes. It's again about yourself. When you move into becoming a cooperation-driven leader from comparison, you are actually engaged with others, and you are, again, other-centric leader where you are concerned about others' well-being. Unfortunately, if you are a leader who is operating from a comparison state, that poison spreads into the organization, and everybody in the organization also works through comparing themselves. And we see in history that as people and people are working more and more towards the me and the mind-centric consciousness, such organizations, though they might have an initial high, slowly tend to plateau and then slowly start to fall down. The third shift that needs to happen is from being an ego-driven leader, you need to become a, um, sorry, from being an ego-driven leader, you need to become a responsibility-driven leader. Now, what is an ego-driven leader? You know, we as human beings have faced a lot of failures and disappointments in our life. It is part of our life. But when we don't heal from these disappointments and failures, we become very, very uh, uh, angry, and we want to show ourselves that we are not small, and that we are nobody, and that we are somebody. And to prove that we are somebody to others, we boost our ego, we boost our arrogance, and we tend to become very authoritative and disconnect from people. So a leader who is driven from ego is again a me and a mind-centric leader. He is not other-centric leader, he or she is not other-centric leader, and is truly not connected to the purpose or the vision. When you become a responsibility-driven leader, you are free of this ego. You are free of this hurts, and you are free of this fear of failure that has happened in your life, and you're truly connected to the purpose as a business leader, as a politician, and you work towards achieving that, pur that purpose by being responsible. You are responsible for others' happiness. You are responsible for your company's state of mind. You are responsible for others' vision. You are this true person who is present to others and not being absent 
in the cell-centric thinking. So our work is to create this new leaders who are able to live and function from this oneness state and not from a state which is separation driven or division driven or a state where it is only about me and the mind and not about the other. So I think if, we, if our inner state as leaders can change and if we can find solutions to our problems from this oneness state, then the solutions we find will be truly authentic and very powerful solutions because you are finding those solutions from a transformed state of consciousness. We see that we are having more and more problems. We are also finding solutions. But unfortunately, the solutions we find today are becoming the problems of tomorrow. And that is because our consciousness is a separation-driven, division-driven consciousness. So the root of all problems that I believe is our state of mind, is our state of being. And our state of mind and our state of being has to fundamentally shift and must fundamentally change, which means we must transcend division and separation and actually experience the state of oneness because today science also proves that we are all one and the fundamental nature of our universe is oneness. And that is our natural state and we need to get there. So that is the work we are doing and we are working towards making sure that every leader in every aspect of society can ultimately live in that state of oneness. Well, I know that uh, the, the entrepreneurs I work with uh, are searching yes. for that, for that uh, peace yes. in, a, in a lot of ways. Murat, please. So I am Murat Sietnipesov. I am representing here uh, Greater Caspian Association, and we are doing promotion and development of the big region, which is called the Greater Caspian Region. And uh, before going further, I would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Frank Richter for organizing this exciting event. Uh, despite all difficulties and complications, all people came from India, from all over the world here to Greece. And uh, here I met uh, a lot of old friends. I got a lot of new friends from Greece, from India, from uh, various countries. And uh, thank you very much for your efforts in this. Uh, now going back, uh, I'm the practical businessman. That's why I will go from the ground. <laughs> yes. and. Uh, uh, Greater Caspian region, 18 countries, uh, uh, joined by the, uh, connected by the culture, by the history, by the business, by the logistics, by the economy, economic ties. And uh, we're talking about Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, South Caucasus, Caspian, five littoral states of the Caspian Sea, then uh, Black Sea countries from Turkey and Romania, Bulgaria till Kazakhstan. We have a lot of problems now in the region. Everybody knows now there is a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. Just recently we had the conflict which was uh, now looks like calm down and uh, accomplished between Azerbaijan and Armenia for the Karabakh area. Uh, also we have uh, some conflicts uh, related to the water uh, in the Central Asia. Now uh, Taliban are in Afghanistan. Uh, and. Uh, it's a changing environment, and it's not easy to do business with this region. Uh, anyhow, uh, businessmen and the people there, they're always trying to find a way how to, uh, to, to do things, how to move things, and uh, how trying to reach the prosperity for the countries and for the, for the whole region. Now, how to involve uh, our target audience here, India and Greece. And Greece is not only Greece as a country, but uh, like a gateway to Europe, the European Union. Uh, to this exercise, like all together, uh, we can move and we can, we can, we can develop uh, things. And then I had several discussions even uh, about the business here, for example, for urea supply from Central Asia to Greece and from Greece to Europe, and uh, for logistics, for logistics corridors, logistics infrastructure. Yesterday I was in Piraeus Sport, just saw what is going on around. And um, uh, what I see here, there are enormous opportunities here in Greece. And uh, yes, there was a crisis, but now country is uh, much better and is already well positioned, well established. Uh, and uh, now country is open uh, for privatization, which is very good news. Uh, although, but privatization should be done wise ways, not like, not like it was done in Russia like 30 years ago, when the whole country was robbed, nothing remained. And now, uh, that's why... Uh, here, I believe that uh, here, Greece uh, could benefit a lot from inviting uh, partners, investors from India, from our region, Greater Caspian region, but not only just to invest money and be the silent investor or silent partner, but actively participate in the development of the business, and particularly in, in logistics sector, develop, uh, facilitating trade. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of things which we can do together, and uh, traditionally our region is the core or the heart of the ancient Silk Road, 
yes, Greece is a little bit more on the south, but anyhow, there are a lot of uh, transit routes going from uh, Caucasus, for example, from Georgia through Turkey to Greece, and uh, which we can utilize. That's why here I see enormous potential uh, for cooperation. And of course, I understand that uh, uh, there are some improvements needed on the uh, Greek system, uh, because uh, I've heard various opinions, and uh, some of them, so some people are saying, oh, it's great, it's easy. Some of them know it's not very easy to do business because a lot of bureaucracy is still existing. Uh, but, uh, uh, the main thing that uh, uh, there is a positive movement, and we should all of us we should try to use this. Uh, and uh, that's why my just main uh, idea is let's try to establish long term and help to establish long term cooperation between India, our Greater Caspian region, and Greece as the gateway to Europe. This, uh, and here we should work all together on this. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Pretty. Namaste, everyone. Kalasphira. Um, I am honored to be on this esteemed panel. I just want to take a moment to thank the organizers of Harasses for inviting me, uh, wonderful Dr. Frank Richter, again, for putting on a show like, like nobody's business, uh, luminaries, your excellencies, and of course, all of you wonderful people who took the time out to come visit. At this very divisive and polarized moment in history, I think it's incredible that possibly two of the greatest civilizations of our planet, Greek and Indian, are here today celebrating each other and I think really introducing each other. And I think that's incredible. The oldest democracy in the world and the largest democracy in the world have more in common today than they ever did. Um, I've always said that strengthening ties with India should really be the cornerstone of European foreign policy. And at the very heart of this foreign policy uh, initiative really should be the Greek connection. So I think Greece is the perfect interlocutor given its civilizational connect with India. And um, because Greece is the gateway between Asia and Europe, and um, India is the bridge between the global south and the global north. Both are uh, the international gateways to probably the largest and the most important water bodies in the world, the Mediterranean Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Nobody will doubt that 2024 has truly been a year of uh, geopolitical importance. And I want to set the stage here today for this discussion this evening. Um, and I want to uh, focus on that aspect as I highlight areas of cooperation between these two great nations. I see three key areas where developing better relations between Greece and India will actually not just help each other, but will have a global impact. Uh, number one, connectivity. So before this conflict in the Middle East was set on fire, the hottest project on the block was IMEC, India, Middle East, European Economic Corridor. Uh, the IMEC holds the key to a great, uh, really supercharging connectivity in the region. It would have connected the world at large. I think um, at the same time, one can see what a vulnerable choke point it is on, on so many levels. I think um, the recent conflict in the Middle East shows, that, shows us that we have to actually handle this with great care moving forward when the corridor is hopefully finally established and once it is established to make sure that it is always protected and security needs are taken care of. Issue number two, security. Uh, this includes specifically counter-terrorism, cyber security, also AI. Uh, I think the two nations sh share common threats. They have common enemies. Um, unfortunately for both of them, they're both fighting the axis of terror, if you will, within the region. I think much can be accomplished by both by, for example, uh, sharing complex intelligence information, which would help, um, I think, not just each other, but the, the larger uh, issue as well, and also 
teaming up in the Indo-Pacific region, because I think this is really going to end up being such a vulnerable point in the future. I think in such an increasingly divided and inflammable world, uh, Greece and India stand at the crossroads of peace and conflict resolution. I think what the world really needs today is um, sta um, sustainable stabilization and two mature democracies acting as safeguards for the waterways for our planet. And the third one, mutual investment. I think heavy investment needs to happen for both countries um, for economic and infrastructure projects of each other. Eurobank is here at the summit. I'm so thrilled to see that. I think a bank like Eurobank having an Indian presence is exactly the need of the hour. Um, I think we must have heard so many times um, over the last two days that the most common reason why Greeks and Indians don't travel that much to each other's countries is simply because of the lack of direct flights. So something that practical and simple. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for the national carriers, both Air India and Aegean Airways, to find uh, the, to have a strategic partner to fill that void. I think from the sick man of Europe to really the country of the year in Europe, Greece has this amazing potential to not just be a power center within Europe, but the world. India is seen as a consensus builder, voice of reason. Many look to it as the leader of the free world in many ways. I think <clears throat> as we, are, we may be on the brink of potentially a world war or a nuclear holocaust, countries like Greece and India really hold the key to a better world, a more peaceful world, and a brave new world out there. So I will leave you with that, and I'm sure we'll discuss on these points. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so great opening statements. Thank you. So my question is, you know, we've talked a lot about the last two days, uh, digitalization, technology, AI, and its impact on, on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and, and economies of, of, of these countries. Um, in, in, and I'm going to ask you each to sort of give me, off the top of your head, your, your opinion on this. And, and maybe, let me re rephrase the question. As you were speaking, I, I changed the question in my mind. But from each one of you, one point of opportunity and one point of something that you're worried about in terms of all this technology and, the, and this new age that we're in, because I think we're at this inflection point in, in, in the world where technology is moving so rapidly that it's hard for people to keep up and people are being left behind. So what's one area of concern for this, for these economies, for your economies, and one opportunity that you see? And briefly, so we can get to many more questions. I think, uh, if, if I may begin. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, Preeti touched upon uh, a very important aspect, which is the airline connectivity. Mm -hmm. And through that, you get tourism, right? I mean, that is the biggest source. And of, cultural understanding, too. Yeah. Right. Uh, because when you, you have cultural exchanges, you have to meet, you know, and right. you have to sort of travel and see the beauty and the heritage. And both countries have lots of it. So it's very important that we have that connectivity and we promote tourism. And uh, India uh, this year is spending 20 billion US dollars on Indians traveling overseas. Okay. Now, a lot of that is directed to Europe, right? And I don't think uh, the travel agents and other travel related organizations, be they hotels, etc., they are not getting into the act of promoting each other's countries to each other. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of money, particularly for Greece, to be earned, whether it is through marriages, whether it's through filming Bollywood movies here, you know, uh, whether it is for conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's a huge thing. And, and, you know, Frank has arranged this conference. And as a result, so many of us have come here, uh, some for the first time, I've come for the second time, uh, but after a gap of many years. 
And first time when I came, it was a tourism. Right. Now I'm here thinking of business opportunities. So tourism is certainly uh, a way of getting business, getting dollars to each other, mm -hmm. or euros to each other in this right. case. And it is something which is going to promote understanding, cultural affairs, friendships, relationships. So I think this is very important, and I'm so happy that Preeti uh, touched on that. And anyway, that was her final point, so I had an opportunity of taking off from that. But that's uh, certainly something uh, uh, that can happen, including medical tourism. India is a very big place for medical tourism. There are a lot of uh, strengths here in the healthcare field. Mm -hmm. I have some Greek friends, and they were telling me about uh, how good the system is here, uh, and not just not for the rich people, even for the common person. So it's amazing. I think there's a lot that can be done. What's your area of concern? Sorry? What's your area of concern? What's my area of concern? I pointed one up in my opening remarks, visas. Visas. Now, okay. the, one of the biggest concerns at the macro level, if I may, is the fact that Greece, being part of EU, has to comply with EU regulations. So if you want to go to trade and have an FTA, there cannot be any FTA between Greece and India. They cannot. It has to be between EU and India. And that will look after the, perhaps the interests of the larger economies right. first because they have more power. Whether Correct. it's Germany, whether it's France. Okay, UK is now out. And UK is now working very seriously on uh, uh, India, UK, uh, free trade, in fact, a comprehensive uh, agreement right. on free trade, free services, uh, free investment flows, and all that. Now, that is a limitation here. So that, that's, a, that's a big problem, uh, including getting visas. You, know, you have to comply to EU regulations. Speaking of your tourist issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Opportunities Maybe I will add and concerns. Like 50 years ago, 70 years ago, even 30 years ago, uh, the rule was who owns the information can rule the world. Now, the situation completely changed because uh, a lot of information is available in the public domains. Everybody practically can have access to this information through internet. And now the rule is who can analyze and process this information properly, can rule the world. But uh, the opportunity, or the opportunities are that everybody can do this now. For that, you don't need to be like the super power. You don't need to have a super computer from your laptop through chat GPT or other uh, instruments like this. You can get uh, w the information of the whole world. You can analyze and you can get results. And here, I, f I feel that there is a great opportunity for everybody in this world, including very underdeveloped countries who, can, who will start using these uh, instruments. They can easily and quite fast to reach the certain level of development, even maybe on the digital side. Now the concern is the unemployment, uh, because uh, a lot of, uh, there, there is an industry uh, with the people, the people working there who are doing this, and now they can easily could be replaced by the AI instruments. And, uh, uh, we already see it. I live in Geneva, in Switzerland. Now a lot of people are on the labor market because, uh, like, big companies don't need any more these analysts, these uh, data uh, specialists, and so on and so on. They, they, they are, you can easily replace, and uh, uh, that's why here. Uh, but on the other side, there is a demand. Maybe now I call it the special profession called operator of ChatGPT, uh, because uh, ChatGPT given a lot of opportunity. The question is how you use it. And then there are plenty of different tricks and uh, uh, possibilities. And now you need to learn how to use yes. the chat GPT. True. Uh, that's why the new profession at least now created. And uh, it's always uh, the balance between the opportunities and challenges and problems. But I think the, it's going to the positive way. Now everybody will be equal with the, pos with the possibilities and opportunities. How they use this is their problem, their yeah. own decision. It's on the government level, on the private level, on the corporate level, no matter. I mean, it's an exciting time, right, with this technology. I mean, it's democratized and, and, and gave, given opportunity to countries and, and people and entrepreneurs and access to data that you never would have had access to before, right? So it's, it is fascinating. Some people use it the wrong way because, like, 
North Fair Korean enough. guys, hackers, citizens, <laughs> stealing money from all over the world, for example. Uh, they are using their own way, but uh, a lot of, a uh, majority of people will use it for the right, well, uh, for, for the right goals. Yeah, and, I mean, and it enhances in communication because I, I've got a, a client that I work with and they do a lot of work overseas and, and in different languages and it has actually stopped, it's, it's helped in miscommunication, it's helped in, in, in how they um, can talk to each other. Yes. Right, and, and how they correspond with each other. And it's, 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 it's been amazing to Maybe see. Maybe one more comment. Yes. There is a profession of entrepreneurs because I'm often on the UN uh, meetings, conferences, and so on. And actually, the interpre uh, sorry, interpreters, not the words. interpreters, they are king of the process. And uh, they did their own uh, translation, everybody lost. And then nobody can check, and then like the whole UN infrastructure dependent on the small group of people who are interpreters. And now with AI, you can easily digitalize it. And then I have uh, in my back, not here, in the room, the device uh, with 40 languages. Yep. Uh, you can do instant translation, you give the uh, headphones to... You can talk to each other. Yeah. You can talk, yeah, with three seconds delay. And, yeah. uh, uh, that's why here, I think it's, it's again available to everybody. You don't need to pay money to bring with you interpreter. If you are going, I don't know, to South Africa, you go to India, you go to Vietnam, you go to China, you can just travel with the device. That's again the opportunities. Everybody can do this. The cost is very low. Yeah. So. You guys have thoughts? Me? Or opportunities no. and, and concerns. I think the concern I would have is uh, the state of humanity. We are probably in the fourth industrial revolution from the time coal in the North invented. Uh, then we had telephone, electricity, and then of course software, and now we have the AI uh, revolution. And uh, with all these revolutions, we are still seeing humanity is disintegrating, as uh, Preeti Ji rightly said, now we're looking at a world war. And why is this integration happening? Uh, this integration happening is because our state, we are not focused on our inner world. We are constantly searching for solutions in the external world and thinking that somehow these solutions will also address our inner world. Uh, for me, there are two worlds, the inner world and the external world. The inner world needs equal importance and attention as we are giving to the external world. And this understanding that somehow my inner world is going to come to peace, will come to joy and happiness through the external is a very wrong understanding. So all of us, I think, have to take this inner journey to find that peace and both the Greek civilization and the Indian civilization the great philosophers from here and in India have contributed massive amount of knowledge and wisdom to the world in trying to find the joy, that happiness through teachings, through virtues, through values. And the Indian sages, I would say, have gone beyond virtues and values to actually addressing the question, who am I? You know, where did I come from and what is my true nature? And uh, fortunately, they found the answer that I am one. I am one with this universe and my true nature is oneness. So they had this powerful mystical experiences and they found that this division and separation that is created by this illusory self is the real problem. And once we can transcend that, then we have found the solution. So uh, I think we should take these great teachings and as we are so focused as leaders on the external, we should also bring a lot of attention to the inner world and transform our state from being this uh, self-centric me and mine state to the other-centric we state, which is a oneness state. Uh, I see if that doesn't happen, whatever changes we might have in the external world, you know, I think our state is deteriorating. That's why we see divorces are on the rise, addictions are on the rise, drug abuses on the rise. You know, uh, every all abuses are on the rise, and people are again and again moving towards a lot of addictions to find solutions for joy and happiness. And people getting into these addiction centers are on the rise. So that is why uh, it is very important that who are we as human beings? It is our inner experience. That is who we are. And we have great minds to invent great things. That's fantastic. I think we will continue to invent. And we will probably ultimately solve the solution of health issues, financial issues, political issues. I think each and every department we will try to solve. But if we reflect back, we are disintegrating as human beings. You know, families are disintegrating. Everything's disintegrating. How do we solve that? You know, today, when my grandfather was alive, he didn't have Facebook, Instagram, nothing. Today we have everything. But why do we get into wars? While we can talk to each other and uh, actually solve the problem. Let me ask you about that because yes. I think that's a. You're bringing something up, and it's not political. Yes. But we don't know how to talk to each other. Yes. Yes. How do we? How do we break? How do we solve that? One of the shifts that I was talking about is the ego-driven self. You know. So unfortunately, uh, we are our past, and our past is our life from the day we are born till today. And uh, there are a lot of wounds within us, 
And as leaders, just because they're leaders doesn't mean that they're not human beings. They're also human beings and they have been wounded in the childhood, they've been wounded from the past. And today science tells us these wounds are also carried forward through three generations. So if your great grandfather is wounded, you carry that information yourself as epigenetic information. So you are just not this person who has gone to school, college, and learned this knowledge and wisdom, but you're far beyond this. That is why your spiritual transformation journey is very important. So the leader has to heal. And only when a healing happens can a connection happen, can true love arise and true peace arise in that person. So if that can happen, which means ego should be gone, pleasure should be gone, comparison should be gone, these things one has to heal from. If you heal from these things, then you become a oneness leader. Your state is changed. And when your state is changed, then you're not going after ideals or beliefs. You know, today, unfortunately, in our society, we have a lot of ideals and a lot of structures that we want to follow, the frameworks. But believe me, every framework is only to be broken. We don't follow frameworks uh, because who we are is our inner experience. That needs to change. And uh, if we can change that, I think everyone can sit across and talk. If two leaders you know, transcend their hurts, transcend their comparison, and transcend their ego, definitely I think they'll be able to speak to each other and connect with the people of their country, connect with human beings, and understand that this war is really not going to help anyone. There are 100 ways in which this can be solved. And that can be just through pure dialogue. But that dialogue can only happen when your state has changed, when your inner state has changed. Otherwise, it will be dialogue after dialogue because the state has not changed. You're going back to the same place. Am I right? Are you wrong? You should not have done this. I should not have done this. And then the dialogue actually enters in finding out more reasons to fight and separate. You know? so, that, so if a dialogue has to change, your inner state has to change. Pretty, what, what are you excited about? What do you see as the big opportunity? What do you see as the concern? I think the great um, opportunity is really realizing how similar we all are rather than how different and is specific, uh, specifically how uh, close uh, the Greek people and the Indian people are. Uh, I mean, you have your big fat Greek Weddings, we have our big fat Indian weddings. And I think it'll be fun one day when we have Indian weddings in Greece, Greek weddings in India. And I think it's starting to happen uh, already and tourism, uh, you know, really connecting with people at, at large and realizing. I think the unique thing about India and Greece is the civilizational connect. You know, both have this 3,000 plus year civilizational history. And when you have that in your DNA, I think your whole worldview is very different. And you know, you, you're inclusive, you're holistic, uh, you're syncretic, you see, uh, you see yourself in each other. And I see that in both, like I feel at home when I come here. And I really think that Greece should be the hottest destination for Indians. And hopefully the, the visa situation, the airlines situation will, will make that um, much easier for, because I think Indians are dying to come to Greece, and, and really they would love it here. Uh, I actually would just want to quote the Honorable Prime Minister of Greece, um, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, who um, said in India uh, recently that the uh, Hindu scripture, uh, Vaisudev Kutumbakam, which translates to the entire world is one family, how relevant that is and also the Sanskrit wisdom is loud and true today as it ever was. And he follows that on um, by saying that uh, ancient civilizations like Greece and India, of course, have um, always had dialogue and discussion and a cross fertilization of ideas. And we must continue that. I think that's missing in today's discourse. But also the unique twist uh, is that we don't just have AI today, we don't just have artificial intelligence, Greece, Greece and India also have another kind of AI, ancestral intelligence, which is again that thousand year old, um, you know, uh, civilizational intelligence that we have. I think there is so much for the world to learn, especially in these divided times. I think they have not been leveraged. They should be for the greater good actually of the world. And I think that's exciting. You know, how do we spiritually rise and use our knowledge and ancient wisdom to actually make the world a better place? I think the, both the countries can do it. Uh, concern, I think Greece should have the confidence to have independent bilateral um, 
relationships, projects with India beyond the EU. I think, I think it is a power center enough to um, sort of do its own thing. I think it's high time it, it sort of steps up to the plate, it can. And I think the world is waiting for that. I think India is waiting for that. I think um, it, we, we, we're gonna thrive in a world where people will have, we are truly in a multipolar world here. So I think it's high time that people uh, really interact with each other rather than just think that it's just one power or for a long time it was bipolar. And I think neither of those are, is the case today. So those are the concerns and opportunities. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got about seven or eight more minutes. I would like to have a question from the audience, but if you can ask it quickly and give our panel a chance to answer, that would be great. Any questions? No? Somebody step up if you, if you have a question for the panel. Yes. So I just take the mic. Take, take the mic here, yes. So my question is to the Krishna ji, how do you relate the spirituality theory or the journey of Greece and India as okay. a historical perspective? Yes, I think uh, as I was saying, you know, there are two worlds, the inner world and the outer world. Uh, we as human beings, be it Greece or India, we are very focused on the outer world and today's generation is very, very much focused on the outer world and we are forgetting the core of our inner world and the strength comes from our inner world. So as human beings, if you start seeing, we are becoming weaker and weaker, our mental strength, our mental stamina, because of the stress and the anxiety about our future, we, internally we are becoming weaker human beings. So we have to have that spiritual or transformational journey where we can learn to find many problems, many solutions to our problems in the inner world. That inner journey has to take place. Only then, whatever you're doing externally will start making sense to you. Your relationships, your business, your leadership, whatever you're doing will start making sense when your inner world heals and when you're connected. Uh, unfortunately, it's the other way around now, where we are thinking we'll find something that will ultimately give me that fulfillment and peace, which is not happening. So if that's true, then the leaders of the world, celebrities must be the most happiest people, which we see are not, which is not the case. So uh, I think India and Greek, uh, Greece have played an important role. Uh, Aristotle, Socrates, they have talked about happiness and fulfillment as being one of the key things in Greece. But India went beyond that to enlightenment, where uh, they actually discovered that, you know, we are one with everything. So that's the greatest contribution India has made. I think if that can be spoken about, taken to the world, and both the worlds can be addressed, uh, it'll be a great solution for humanity. Otherwise, we will be, fo we will be uh, growing in the external. Mm -hmm but degenerating within. And uh, that is why we are seeing so many problems with all the technology we have in our hand because of our inner state, yeah. My next question would be to the call, sir, and pause, sir. Yes. I think, I, because you have mentioned a very nice thing that we should have a direct flight because it's the shortest journey from Delhi to the one of the destination in Europe. Because most of the thing that I've seen that people go to Dubai, mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's a three and a half and four hours of in the four flight. Hours. And for Greece in Athens, if I say, if, if they would have been a direct, I think five and five and a half maximum. So why, what was lacking for not having this direct flight for a very long time? And like, there were economic reasons for a reason that how many number of passengers and there's a lot of mathematics that the airline industry do. But what is the historically wrong that have been done and can be redone now for the future? You want me to take it? Yes. That to me? Yes. See, uh, the, the thing is, uh, today, uh, the, if there was a direct flight, it would actually be uh, about 6 hours, 45 minutes. You said around 7, so that's, that's good, right? But the problem is that the traffic, people movement between India and Greece and vice versa has never been very large. Mm -hmm. But the simple fact that Indians till very recently didn't have the money power to travel. So this, uh, this 20 billion uh, that we are going to spend this year as Indians, just to give you an example, last year it was 17 billion US dollars. And before that it was, you know, maybe much less. And then for, you know, two years there was COVID, so there was no travel. So I think now is the opportune time to look at these aspects. 
Uh, also, now I know as far as the Greek side go, they are acquiring some of the A350s, which will be able to take you nonstop. Because the smaller aircrafts, you know, they can take you about four hours. So you have to stop somewhere in between to refuel and, and carry on. So that was the thing. But what is most important is we need to have a catalyst, whether the catalyst is the government, whether it is the travel agents, whether it's a combination of travel agents and the hotel chains, they have to market to each other. I mean, the tour agents, we see so many ads during our holiday season in India, lots of them saying, go here, go there, here. and they have, you know, very attractive packages. That's because they have the connectivity with the hotels and airlines and they can give those right. good packages. That has not happened when Greece is here, mm. unfortunately. But the time is right now, I think. It's there's really an, there's right an evolving middle class now that can travel. Yes, yes. Right. You know, right. I mean, uh, I think the ability for Indians to travel is about 100 million people, right? Yes. Okay, we have 1.4 billion, we have 400 uh, million very poor people, but we have 100 million people who can afford to travel. That, that's bigger. That's 10 times the size of Greece, just to give you an example. Right. So there is a huge amount of travel, and I think uh, for reasons that uh, Preeti has mentioned and perhaps many of us have touched, there is that connect, cultural connect, and uh, curiosity, if I may use that word, to, to come to Greece. Right. Should, it should be a target market. I mean, yeah. that's a, yeah. that ability to travel, that's probably more people than Europe combined. So it's a question of the marketing <laughs> uh, aspect and getting the cultural togetherness, etc. Another area, if I may just uh, respond or interrupt or add on, is, you know, we do not have enough student exchange program mm. between the universities. Yeah. That is something which does not cost anybody anything because the students pay for it. They right. travel low and... And universities have places to stay, colleges, both places. And that is something which I think is a very important uh, connect that is possible. I've seen this with South Korea, who I was involved in wearing another hat. And with South Korea and India, over the last 20, 25 years, there's been a huge improvement through student exchange programs. Yeah, that's, that's massive. And if there are any entrepreneurs out there, he just gave you. He, he, he just gave you a business yes. to focus on. There's a lady there. Yes. So, uh, so this question is not about business, but I was just wondering when, especially we have with us, uh, Mr. Krishnaji here, and I was listening to you about how to have dialogues and overcome ego, self ego. Yes. So I'm just thinking across the world, in many parts of India as well, and Thank in this you. region also, there are. You know, wars and difficulties to come to conciliation is not happening. It's a stalemate. We talk about business leaders, we talk about political leaders to take the first stance of solving this world problems. But is it not the time now to also ask spiritual leaders to come together and have a dialogue, start a dialogue? And, and my um, suggestion is because I feel at least the spiritual leaders have more control over themselves or they are practicing to control, have control over themselves. They can maybe initiate dialogue. So I'm just focusing that if not becoming, you know, hopeless, we can become hopeful to think that dialogue can bring in change. And I'm just asking this to you that uh, is it something that you people are, you know, in the spiritual fraternity, this kind of thinking is starting to come up or not? Or Definitely. you feel, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> we are all separate and we can do our own bit. No, no. In fact, our, the root of our understanding is that we are one. In. And that this separation is caused by this mind which is uh, no conditioned to feel separate over many, many centuries. And we can transcend this conditioning. Uh, yes, spiritual leaders, we are working at individual level. We are working at organizational level. Uh, but I think for us to be at the level of addressing wars, I think it should be a government initiative where we are also invited to come and uh, give solutions. But if you look at ancient India, that is why it was so important that the kings always had a spiritual master who was advising them. So there was always a, you know, 
spiritual guru who was advising the kings and the kings used to take used to see the the greatness of indian philosopher is not only that the philosopher give morals and values but also worked on the leader's state so before making any important decision the guru or the teacher guru means teacher it's a sanskrit word the teacher made sure that the king's state is peaceful that his state is calm and that he is really making the right decision not from a conflicted state but from a beautiful state that needs to happen today and uh, yes we as spiritual leaders uh, we can contribute to that but at that level i think it should be an initiative from the government to ask us and uh, but uh, but in our own capacity yes we are working with we are present in over 50 countries we work with business leaders celebrities political leaders and our focus is to transform that state and tell people that you don't need to fight not just as countries but even within families even as individuals you don't need to fight we don't need to raise a voice and become agitated angry to solve a problem there's a different way to solve that problem and that way is to actually be peaceful and calm and from that state okay get the problem and address it see we tell people that problem and stress are two different things a problem need not cause you stress a problem is a challenge you need to find a solution to solve that problem it's an external thing you don't need to go or massive stress to solve that problem and make your ego so big that you know i have to solve this and it has to be my way uh, but that can only happen when that state changes uh, so yes we are working with leaders to make that happen but definitely i think for many many uh, problems the solution is a dialogue and a dialogue from a beautiful inner state that is the fundamental root if that root is not being addressed we are only addressing the branches and we're trimming it and we're trying to make the tree look more beautiful while the soil is completely polluted and uh, you know is full of poison we are not seeing the fruits and uh, that's why humanity is going through more massive challenges and more massive challenges because this inner state is deteriorating very fast and and look i would say that the government is not going to 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 <laughs> to help this agenda i mean i think this has to come from leaders this has to come from the people in this room it has to come from yes. you and i yes. and we have to want to to live in that sort state. of state and so uh, i i don't think government's the solution to that but i think that maybe they play a role in some yeah. ways but absolutely but i think it's up to private industry and leaders to to, I agree to drive that that's it's, it's a faster route definitely that future right <laughs> yes. right so uh, thank you so much for your participation today thank you for being involved I'm going to turn it over to you for the final word. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rhett. It's, uh, I think it's been a, a great two days. Uh, we've had uh, 250 people coming in and out of the various rooms, be there, uh, the uh, uh, sort of networking lunches and sessions, dinners. We've had five of them. We've had five ministers, including one from India. Uh, we've had 25 countries, and of course that includes Indians from US, Indians from UK, Indians from Singapore. You know, out of 1.4 billion people, Indians are kind of all over. But still, there are 25 uh, different countries in terms of passports participating here. Um, we've had 26 dialogue sessions, 26, that's a big number. They're kind of the specialized uh, sessions dedicated to specific areas which have been covered in these two days and of course uh, including our closing plenary we've had seven uh, plenaries now what have been the main takeaways from here other than the uh, old friendships which we've revived and the new friends we've made well i think it's very clear that both india and greece are poised for accelerated growth through partnerships. Second, the areas of these partnerships would include shipping and logistics, include IT, AI, data and analysts, and the startup ecosystems in both countries, tourism, Indian companies using Greece as a hub for not just the EU, but also the Middle East and Africa. I think that is one unique uh, position that Greece is in. And I think this needs to be marketed uh, both 
by the Greek government and I think in India, the, the business people need to go out and spread that word, the chambers of commerce, etc. India is the one of the world's largest growth engines. And just as a matter of interest, this year, we are going to contribute to 15% of the new growth globally, right? Of course, we are still less than the US and little less than China, but we are the number three in the world in ter terms of taking this. And we are moving forward. We are moving forward. We are moving forward rapidly. And finally, Greece is the fastest growing economy in Europe. So when you put these two together, I mean, we have the framework ready for us, a framework which Frank has uh, provided to, I think, all of us. And Frank, to you, I must have, you've already been thanked, but I must say you've done yet again another outstanding job. It's his 16th India meeting. So just stand up, Frank. Just stand up. Back to you. Well, thank you, and have a great evening, a great trip home, but we have a meal to eat, and so let's go do that, and let's go break bread together. Don't forget and, uh, the, a good Greek wine to drink. Oh, ah, yes. Lots, lots of it. <laughs> I would like to thank Frank again, and all your team for putting up this beautiful thank event, you. and so it's definitely moving towards oneness and other yeah. centric uh, thinking. So thank you, know, thank you so much, Frank. So much. Now, I, I want the crowd involved for a second, because I want to take a selfie yes. with everybody from this Still way. Right. Okay. <laughs> Frank, you got to come up. You got to come up, Frank, and, right. and you got to come and get in, in the picture. Oh, yeah. oh, you're going to do it this Let's see if we have long enough arms here. Uh-huh. You want to do it? I got everybody come in. Come You guys come on. Come on. Come on. Get into celebration. I think, yes. Yes, please. Here we go. One, two, three. All right. Nice. Great. Wonderful. What a wonderful panel. Wonderful.